So the other side of thinking about data is what do consumers think? Yes, some consumers are going to go and look at all that documentation, but that is not all consumers. Many consumers are just going to judge your product based on the experience and make a decision. I'm one of those people and I'm going to show you an example. So my birthday is October 5th. Last year I got this message from my dentist who I had not seen in 15 years. And um, I'm not sure why they're messaging me. Maybe they want me to come back, but I'm definitely not going back because I don't live in Philadelphia anymore. I live 3,000 miles away on the other side of the United States in San Francisco. And I wanted them to stop messaging me. Please delete my records. Don't contact me. But I can't do that. Actually, if I want to delete my record, I'm going to have to go and contact them. And it's a whole thing. So I'm already a little bit upset, I will definitely not recommend this dentist to my friends in Philadelphia. Um, now I keep getting this message. So this Saturday, I was in Kolkata, many more miles away from this dentist in Philadelphia, and I'm paying for this because they're text messaging me while I'm here in India. So this is just an example. That consumers make split-second decisions. Um, and to talk about the consumer experience and how that impacts your product and your operations and your costs. I'm going to bring to the stage Stan Myung. He's our vice president and um, general manager of our emerging markets group. He's based in Taiwan. And please welcome me in joining the stage. Hey, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. This is, I think, my at least 15 times that I've been to Bangalore. So uh, prior to joining Mozilla, I joined Mozilla this year, uh, but I spent 15 years at uh, Hewlett Packard, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and so we were always, always in India, always in Bangalore, Electronic City, all over Bangalore, we know. Uh, so I had spent a lot of time here. I had so many great uh, colleagues and friends here, so I'm happy to be back here. Tonight after the event, we're gonna go to the Paul and have my favorite Kerala restaurant, have a palms and uh, enjoy our dinner. But let me talk to you about business impact, business outcomes, and how lean data uh, really should be thought of as a competitive advantage. Um, it shouldn't be thought of as an overhead um, and definitely not an afterthought, right? And so we all work for companies. Companies have a brand. Uh, they spend lots and lots of money developing a brand. Um, very simple quote from Warren Buffett. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. Right? Um, that applies to many things, including very infamous, famous data breaches and or misuses of uh, user uh, private data, right? Um, these are just a few of the big headlines. I think you hear of data breaches in companies all the time. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because data breaches are when we all become aware of, oh my gosh, some company was breached uh, with user and user data was there, and all of a sudden we, it highlights what kind of user did they act, user data did they have, and that's when everyone realizes that we have a problem, right? Um, case in point, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, uh, what is that, a $5 billion penalty that Facebook was uh, fined this year by the US government. Uh, Equifax, I'm sorry, and going back to that, that's uh, regarding how Cambridge Analytica, if you weren't uh, paying attention, uh, regarding how they use data uh, in a way where it would be used to, uh, for political ads and to, to potentially even change uh, uh, votes from, that were cast by people in the US, right? So very, very serious offense, uh, major issue. Equifax, very, very large credit agency in the US, 145 million users were affected. Uh, believe the CIO went to prison uh, over this, not, only, not because of the data breach, but because of other issues regarding, I believe, um, uh, insider trading, knowing about this in advance, 
uh, of it being public, and but but still, there are consequences to these type of things, right? Marriott, uh, largest hotel chain, five years of data were breached by hackers. Um, 500 million users in their reservation system. Um, and probably, I believe it's like 120 million in fines. Um, but most importantly, the brand of these companies have been tarnished, uh, which um, really is, uh, I think, a huge detriment. Their, their stock price, uh, billions in market capitalization uh, were affected negatively. So all these have very, very big consequences. Right? Um, and it's when we have these big data breaches and it's in the news, that's when people realize uh, that we've got a problem and soon you have government regulators getting involved. And what we want to talk about is, look, it's not a technology problem. It really is a people process problem. It's a people problem. Uh, users are impacted because their, their data gets breached uh, without their knowledge that it was even collected sometimes. But also, the employees of the companies, it's their custodial responsibility to uh, take care of company and user data, right? And so um, when we don't take it seriously, there are consequences, both you know, business and to people, to consumers. So what happened? Well, 2018 was kind of a wake-up call for the IT industry. I know so because I was in IT at the time. And uh, uh, I remember working in my last job where I would say one third to one half of the IT innovation spend was pretty much canceled out because all of a sudden every project uh, had to be delayed because we were all working on various kinds of GDPR compliance projects. And so uh, we just, you know, it was a, something that caught us by surprise and, and having to refactor, modify your applications, then realizing that, you know, it's not as easy as it thinks, as it sounds, and you have hundreds and hundreds of applications that, that we were dealing with. Um, but when governments get involved and regulatory actions take place, um, you know, you you think about the the law. I mean, this GDPR regulation. Um, it's if you look into the details, yes, there's a compliance aspect, but it is very wide-reaching. Um, technically, if a U.S. citizen is flying over a European uh, EU country, and they happen to be signing up for a service on the plane, technically they're covered by GDPR uh, regulations. It, it's, it's that broad and reaching, and it doesn't matter what kind of data. Any kind of data, uh, no matter how small it is, that can identify a person is covered by this regulation, and uh, users need the right to be able to erase their data. So I remember developing products, uh, apps, thinking, wow, I've never thought about how could you easily erase a user's data, right? It's, it wasn't something we thought about. We just thought about collecting as much data as we could and storing it in a place, and then, you know, it, and it would start there. So um, I think this really was a wake-up call. And there are penalties that are associated with GDPR, but as any company that's doing business around the world, you know what, uh, something that the EU does, it's going to impact every company that, that does business globally or is thinking about doing business globally or think about doing business with anybody in the EU. Um, there's more regulations that are probably coming. California is coming out with a 2020 Data Privacy uh, Act as well. So there's more of these coming. Um, so instead of being reactive, and this is when Rebecca's point about at Mozilla, they actually didn't have to do a whole lot because they were already, it was already part of their culture, philosophy, and data governance was key to uh, developing any product or feature inside Mozilla. Right? And so this is what we want to share with you today, how you can actually build good products this way. Right? So we also know that in India, there's a, a PDP, Personal Data Protection Bill, that's in draft form. It's there as a, as a way to, uh, to be on a similar level as GDPR. It will do actually quite a lot of things. It will uh, hopefully create more business opportunities for Indian IT uh, companies that are providing services to, pr to work on applications that are GDPR compliant, obviously, but also works for the country of India and its citizens. Um, but if you think about it, if you're developing an IT solution, you should really understand the, the requirements that are going in it. Why, right? And so um, I believe that users in India actually 
have an increasingly higher awareness of data privacy, personal data privacy. Right? And uh, I'm responsible in my day job of uh, launching products inside this uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, India included. And we, we really want to understand what the users are doing, what are they thinking. And so we, we asked, we started asking our users who use our Firefox products, our Firefox Lite. It's a mobile Android uh, browser that we've launched in India and also Southeast Asia. Um, we asked our users, we interviewed them uh, across Southeast Asia. Um, why do you use VPN? Uh, what's your opinion of personal data? And why do you use a, a browser's private mode, or you may also know it as incognito mode? Why do you use that? Right. And we're trying to ex understand our users' um, insights, right, uh, in in these in these studies. And so uh, we'll go in de into detail on each one of these. But for example, VPN. Why VPN? Well, they want a free content. They want to explore different content around the world. They want to break the bubble. Um, and that's a very interesting one I'll talk about in a second. About personal data, well, people believe, uh, our, you know, our respondents believe that personal data is their data that they own. You, you own your own personal data. Your digital footprint is you, right? Um, the world is increasingly becoming digital. And so you have a, you know, you have your, your medical records, you have a, a physical health that you're taking care of. Well, your digital health, I think, is just as important. You have a footprint on, in the internet. And um, why browser mode? Why browser private mode? Well, it's really to seek protection, uh, to be more anonymous, to, uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to engage and browse on the internet uh, in, at your leisure in privacy, right? So let's deep dive into this, each one of these. So freeing the content and breaking the bubble. So we found uh, in our interviews with our Firefox Lite users that the access to content is a core aspect of the right to freedom of exp expression. So users in India believe that they have the right to explore content from anywhere around the globe. Um, they, they shouldn't be, have restrictions. Um, one of the most uh, quote, funniest quotes that I'll remember or long-lasting quotes is, one of our users said, you know, I'm just tired of receiving Bollywood music suggestions from my streaming music app because it's not my favorite kind of music, right? But you, that's called, you know, being in a bubble because you're in this location. Uh, the app company assumes that you just like this one genre, so you're going get, to keep getting these uh, recommendations, right? Um, we find that our users will go, obviously, use VPNs to go outside the borders. Um, use VPN or private mode to go to, again, break this bubble or stereotype. And even use cases of searching for airline tickets, using a VPN in another country to verify that the price could not be, you know, may be lower and, and, and understanding that. Because I think users in India are very tech savvy, right? You, know, you understand that airline companies may change prices. And so you want to verify that by, by having a VPN to, to check your prices. So that happens, it's a, it's a use case. Around personal data, it's definitely considered a personal asset. So um, companies should not use my personal data before asking me. So they need to ask my permission. So this is a, a typical insight that we, that we get. And here's a quote, what I am worried about most about is not only the giants like Facebook and Google taking my personal data, but the third party companies that I have no idea about. I don't know how they will take advantage of my data. Right? Um, so you know, we see users, you know, checking the app permissions, making sure that that you know apps have particular um, permissions that they're they're not overextending their permissions. Um, at Mozilla, we have an, a concept that the browser being a user agent. So uh, we consider their browser to be uh, your entry point or portal into the internet. And we want to build a browser that's going to protect you and provide that security and uh, as you browse into the internet, right? And uh, we believe that Firefox does a lot better job of that than Chrome, right? Things like tracking protection, for example. All right, and the third part, asking about why users use incognito mode or private mode in a browser. Well, 
um, the insight here is that, well, I have to take my own action to ensure that I get real protection online. Right? Here's a quote, I have blank political views. If the government knew this, they might hurt me or they may hurt me and my family. Um, so people are concerned about maybe uh, trust with government or maybe not government, but other agencies or other groups. And so uh, people want to be able to, um, you know, that, 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 that's a fear it, it, that's, that came up. But people want to be able to browse uh, on their own. Uh, people will use uh, separate or different search engines as a common use case, use private mode more often uh, to have, you know, again, uh, turning off trackers, turning on private mode. Think these are all things that um, users, I believe, who are uh, aware of privacy um, use, and they take their own action. That's the point. These are actions that people take on their own, right? So it all comes down to this, you know, building a product and having customers trust in your product, your brand, and your company. And, and it is an invisible currency that people don't talk about in terms of privacy being part of this customer trust. And I think that's important because um, just this year, I think you may have heard the Apple keynote speech uh, about, I think, around May. There was a big you know, product launch that Apple normally does twice a year. But they spent 10 minutes talking about privacy. 10 minutes. And how you know, Apple was a champion for privacy. Um, then I think Google followed suit. I think the CEO of Google responded back in the media that said, well, privacy should not be a luxury. It, it should be, for, for, I think, for everyone. And, um, and I think uh, Facebook also had uh, Zuckerberg who said uh, in his, one of his keynotes for a developer conference said that the future is privacy. Right? So we are seeing this, hey, which, you know, whose privacy is better than whose, right? And all in this rhetoric uh, in these large tech companies, um, I guess I, 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 my job here is to make, make you ask the question, uh, where was this five years ago? Uh, you know, what in the business model and in the data that companies are using and collecting, uh, how is that open? How is that giving users more choice? And how is that lean, right? And so it's up for you to decide. Uh, but it's clear that user sentiment, customers, uh, consumer sentiments about privacy is definitely on the rise. That's why you hear this in a lot of the marketing and the branding in many tech companies today, right? Uh, so here we, at, you know, Mozilla, we're here to help. We're here to talk about how we believe is the right way to approach this in our company philosophy. And I think this idea of data governance, this idea of building um, data privacy and, and policies around um, protection of data into a company's product development, into even the company's culture and philosophy. I think it's important. Uh, as I think Rebecca mentioned, everyone's trying to get into uh, everyone's trying to get to AI, right? And uh, there's a lot of tools, uh, open source tools around machine learning, um, and everybody's moving towards it. Everyone's collecting data, but I think they're doing it in a way and we, that I think our position is that you, sh you should really have a lean approach, a smart, intelligent way of doing that. Um, otherwise, you're, you're wasting resources. You're making life difficult for data scientists. And if the norm of the future is AI and you have data collected, big data, and you're um, doing machine learning models, well, the differentiator is the quality of your data. Right? And so by starting at the beginning on understanding why you want your product to have certain types of data and why is it valuable in your product and mapping everything back to that, then you're going to have, I think, a much cleaner data set to work with, which can be a better competitive advantage. If there's regulations and regulatory changes that happen, you're gonna be in a much better position down the road, right? And the case in point is GDPR, right? So, where to go from here? So lean data practices, that's what we're here to talk about and we, why we think it's so important uh, to come here and to talk to you all about it. Um, I believe that companies have the responsibility to protect user data and company data as well, of course. Right? So stay lean. Decide if all your data collected 
actually has value, right? Um, and learn how to protect customer data. Um, engage your users. Keep them informed. Give them a choice. Keep, make them empowered. It's more engaging. It makes your products more engaging. So we'll go, the, we'll go in these three areas a little bit more in detail. So how to, how to stay lean. Uh, decide if all your data collection delivers value. Do I need this data to provide the value that I'm trying to deliver? What data do I have? Do we have? How do you collect your data? Why are you collecting this data? What for? What's the purpose? What business value is there? And when do you delete the data? And how do you empower the user? And what's that user journey look like, right? Around building security in your product. So you've got to learn how to protect customer data. It has to be core in you know, your company's philosophy and data governance plans. So how are you protecting customer data? Who has access to this data? How is this data being handled? Whom in the company has access to this data? Um, what security measures are there? Security, we're talking about things like security groups, right? And how do you know, and how do you know when you have a problem, and, and what will you do? What's, what's, what's the uh, operating procedure to handle um, you know, data, some sort of data, data breach, even in, in, at an internal level, right? And finally, around engaging your users, right? Keep your users informed, empowered, do your customers know of your data practices? Are you being open about it? And, and, how, and what kind of context are you connect, collecting the data? Can you provide more choice and control for your users to give them more empowerment? And can you make your privacy poly, policy more accessible, right? Uh, front and center even, right? And perhaps you could have a transparency report on how your company handles um, uh, user data. So going back to this uh, great pyramid that Rebecca had shown, right? So we're all, you know, I think a lot of companies are moving towards, you know, take, trying to harness big data, collecting as much data as they can, um, and trying to reach the pinnacle. Uh, I think there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of environmental waste around electricity, cost of cloud. I mean, it may be in the cloud, but it's still taking electricity at somewhere. So saving the environment. This is all, you know, if you think of it, Practicing lean data is going to save the planet because you're saving electricity as well. That's the way I think about it. Um, but you know, how how are we all you know as companies and as as engineers moving towards the top, but doing it in a way where we don't have a plan? And our our goal tonight is to uh, empower you guys to think about how can we do this in an intelligent way. And by doing it in an intelligent way, in an intelligent way you're going to be helping your future self. And uh, it's clear in the past few years, and it's going to be clear very, you know, very soon in the future. All right? So here is a QR code about where you can learn more about Lean Data Practices. You can also go to leandatapractices.com, and you can also scan this QR code. And uh, we're going to leave this up here. And uh, I'm going to invite Mika back up to take us to the next session for Q&A.